Welcome, Ben Mama. Originally known as the Acorn Proton, the BBC Micro was initially conceived as a replacement for the rather limited Acorn Atom computer. The final version of the machine actually came about due to the BBC Computer Literacy Project, where it beat off the aggressive advances of Sinclair Research to win the contract and appear in schools across the UK. Released in 1981, the price of the machine was well out of reach for most households at the time, but its presence in schools not only helped convince better off families to make the investment, but also meant that a rather large audience of children got to experience the machine first hand. This makes the BBC Micro extremely unique, a system that many people have huge amounts of nostalgia for, despite never having owned one. Indeed, I myself used the BBC Micro in both junior and senior school, but it was the latter that was particularly important. We had a specially designed computer room with 15 linked up BBCs, as well as three Acorn Archimedes. I would use these almost every day through our computer club and got myself an A in computer studies thanks to a program I wrote on the BBC that helped people choose the right computer or console to buy their children for Christmas. Growing up, my next door neighbour Martin also had a BBC Master, so I got to play plenty of games on the Beep out of the classroom too. The original BBC A and BBC B models had 16K and 32K of memory respectively, but the B proved to be the more popular and more useful machine. Other models followed in due course, including the Master, which featured 128K of memory and was found in most senior schools, and the Master Compact with its PC-like pizza box design. The Beeb, as this effectually became known, was eventually replaced with a BBC-branded version of the 32-bit Acorn Archimedes in 1987, but wasn't officially discontinued until 1994 due to its widespread use in schools. Although an educational machine in concept, it was of course widely used to play video games too, as this video will very much go on to prove. The Beeb has a large library of games with a surprisingly high quantity of excellent exclusives, so putting this video together was actually harder than you'd imagine. But I'm pretty happy with my final 10 choices, as I feel it covers a lot of different genres and styles that will hopefully appeal to everyone watching this. So let the games begin! This is the story of Daphne, who longs to be alone with her very own BBC Micro. Alas for Daphne, Acorn have also made it rather attractive to small businessmen. Hello, Dad. <laughs> Tragically, they've even made it irresistible to accountants. Hello, Uncle Cyril. How did you get going? And sad to say, it's become vital for everyone who needs up-to-the-minute information. Thanks to its Prestel and Teletext adapters. Worst of all, it's absolutely bung-ho for busy administrators. And then there are those visitors who want to use its unearthly scientific potential. Poor Daphne. The BBC microcomputer system is a world leader and it's still growing. Certain gaming characters have become synonymous with specific systems over the years, often being called mascots. There's Sonic the Hedgehog and the Sega Mega Drive, Minor Willy and the ZX Spectrum, Crash Bandicoot and the PlayStation, and Mario on, well, any Nintendo platform really. When it comes to the BBC Micro, then that mascot is undoubtedly Repton, a strange looking cross between a lizard and a man. There's a wide plethora of different Repton games available for the Beeb, many of which were converted to other systems too, but there were also several that weren't, and remain exclusive, like Repton Through Time. I particularly like the setting of this one, hence why I chose it for this video. The original game was actually programmed by then 16 year old Tim Tyler, after having seen screenshots of Boulder Dash in a magazine. It's pretty clear that he only saw the game and didn't play it, because although the Repton games look very similar initially, when you play them you'll find the gameplay to be quite different. That's because Repton has far more emphasis on the puzzle solving aspect than the digging and adventuring of its inspiration. The objective here is the same as ever, to grab all the diamonds, 
find a key and get to the exit within the time limit. However, this is made harder by giant boulders that get in your way, enemies that chase you relentlessly, and diamonds that are locked away. With a library that features so many versions and clones of other people's games, it's always nice to find an original title for the BBC Micro, especially one as good as this that also remains exclusive to the machine. In the game you play as Fred, a warehouse manager who has discovered that his workplace has been overrun with aliens. The problem is that he has a stack of orders that he needs to get sent out. So he grabs his laser gun and heads out into the corridors. There are several key elements to this game that I will endeavour to explain. Firstly, there are the aliens. These arrive via portals and can be shot. Once you destroy a portal, no more aliens can come through and the room is cleared. The next thing you need to know about are the orders themselves, which take the form of pieces of paper you must find in the maze-like warehouse. Once you find an order, it then tells you the objects you need to find to complete that order. Last but not least, you need to actually send the order to the customer and to do that, you must also find Fred's office and then take the objects you find to his desk. With an incredible 400 rooms to explore, Warehouse is a really huge game, especially for a 32K computer that will keep you playing for a very long time to come. The attractive graphics and decent sound also help round out this impressive package that I can't help but recommend. In this really unique arcade adventure, you play the part of a wizard trying to escape an underground lair that he's become trapped inside of. I won't go into the plot here because that's quite long and complex, but I was impressed by its originality, a bit like the rest of this title actually. The first feature of note here is where your character can take on three different forms. Each of these comes with its own unique abilities, meaning you'll have to transform between the three quite regularly in order to complete the game. Firstly, his original role, that of a human wizard, allows him to cast spells using objects you collect. Secondly, you can transform into a monkey, who's able to climb ropes amongst other things. And lastly, there is the cat, which blesses you with extra jumping abilities. Working out what character to use and where is a key part of the game. You are limited to 150 transformations in total, which might sound like a lot, but this is a pretty huge game, and it's easier than you'd think to run out. You select your character and what objects you want to use using the icons and a pointer in the top control panel. Very innovative for the time. While simple keyboard controls allow you to move around each level. Both the graphics and sound here are bland and unimpressive, but the gameplay is strong enough that you won't really care that much. Imogen is a must have for BBC adventure game fans. In this Gauntlet-inspired arcade adventure, you play the part of the legendary King Arthur on a quest to retrieve his stolen sword Excalibur, as well as the crown jewels themselves. 
Aware of your notoriety across the kingdom, you disguise yourself as the lowly archer and set off towards the enemy castle. Medieval England is a dangerous place though, and there are many hazards in your way, including the enemy guards. The game is split into four multi-directional scrolling stages, with a bonus jousting competition to compete in between each one. Arthur has both a limited amount of health and arrows, but these can be topped up by collecting items that you can find on your quest. Courtyard is extremely unusual for a top-down dungeon crawler of this type, in that you don't have a status panel on the screen. You have to press the spacebar to bring this up. This acts as a pause feature too, and also means you can have a larger play area than normal. The impressive graphics are big, bold and very colourful, but I have to say that I found the push scrolling quite annoying, as it can lead to some pretty cheap deaths. The audio is fairly simple, but it does serve its purpose pretty well. The BBC didn't get an official port of Gauntlet for some reason, probably the only major 8-bit micro not to, so Courtyard serves as a pretty decent alternative for the most part, especially as it also includes an editor to create your own levels too. A driving game by legendary BBC Micro programmer Peter Johnson, you say? Where do I sign up? It's safe to say that I was pretty excited to try out Overdrive, having only been aware of the excellent BBC port of pole position back in the day. The two games certainly aren't dissimilar, and it's easy to see where Peter's inspiration came from. But while it remains closest to Namco's seminal racer in style, there are also several elements here that appear to have been borrowed from another classic racing game in Activision's superb Enduro. Once you've jumped into the driver's seat, you need to finish in the top 12 in each race and attempt to win the prestigious championship. There are no gears or advanced controls to worry about here, simply drive as hard and fast as you can to the finish line. Each race takes place in different surroundings including your standard circuit, as well as snow, desert, night and the lakes. This actually doesn't make a great deal of difference to the way the game plays, unlike Enduro, which is a bit of a shame. Graphically, the game is very smart with great colours, nice detail on the cars, and the variation of the surroundings is really nice. Audio is pretty average, but pretty much what you'd expect in a racing game of this type. Whilst I don't think Overdrive pips pole position to the post as the BBC Micro's best racing game, it's certainly a more than competent title for all the petrol heads out there. In this classic platform game you must guide the titular boffin through a series of caverns, much like many other similar games of the time, but Addictive's product has one very original gimmick that very much sets it apart. Although boffin can only jump short distances, he can fall from any height by opening his umbrella to slow his descent and land safely. This umbrella mechanic was very unique for the time and means that many levels progress from the top of the screen to the bottom which was unusual as most platforms of this era required the player to travel from bottom to top. Each level ends when you manage to touch your owl, which is usually perched at the bottom of the screen. However, this owl can only be handled if you've already destroyed all the unlucky upside down horseshoes scattered around the screen, otherwise you'll meet your death. Another notable feature of the game is the giant tarantulas, which cannot be killed. These ugly arachnids remain motionless until you're in their line of sight, then they'll rapidly run towards you, causing instant panic. The boffin tape actually contains two different versions of the game. The first version features 25 caverns and is playable on both the BBC Micro and Electron. 
The second version is for the BBC only and features 20 more caverns, as well as being totally redesigned to take advantage of Mode 5 visuals to make it much more colourful. In Impact Software Xenon, we have one of the games that is often brought up by BBC owners as a good example of what the machine can do in the right hands, and how it is more than capable of keeping up with its 8-bit rivals, as we moved on to the next decade. It wasn't a game I had actually played before this point, as my BBC only next door neighbour had moved on to the Atari ST by the time this came out. The game itself is a horizontally scrolling, all action run and gun, a genre that we rarely see on the BBC Micro. It's also one of the few BBC games that supports two players at the same time, which is very cool indeed. Your character starts off with a simple laser as you run towards the right hand side of the screen, blasting away the wide variety of enemies. But before long, a range of different power ups become available that can be collected to upgrade this. You're going to need them too, as Xenon is a seriously tough game. The enemies are relentless, and you'll be surprised just how long, or should that be not long, the seemingly generous four lives and long energy bars last when you first start playing. It's actually a shame that the difficulty is so brutal, because there's no doubt in what an accomplished game Xenon is. The graphics are absolutely stunning, the sound effects and music are amongst the best on the BBC, and the controls are nigh on perfect. Outside of games for systems I personally owned, there are very few, if any, games that stick in my mind as much as Citadel. In fact, the only other game I hold in the same regard is another BBC Micro Classic in Granny's Garden. The biggest reason for this is what happens when the game boots up, and some absolutely stonking speech welcomes you in. Thankfully, the actual game is every bit as impressive as that intro sequence. Citadel is a sprawling arcade adventure where you're tasked with exploring the titular building and its grounds to recover five magic crystals and then return them to the correct locations. Once you've completed your task, you must enter a teleport to reach the final part of the game. But, rather uniquely for a game like this, Citadel doesn't actually end there, because you are then transported back and you don't get to see the end screen until you've completed all of the first part and then accrued the maximum 99 points upon your return. There are also some other very interesting features that really make Citadel stand out, such as the ability to choose your sex and the way your energy works. In this game you can't just charge through rooms taking hits instead of avoiding the enemies, because if you do the computer gets wise and puts you back to where you started. With over 100 rooms to explore, this is certainly a game that you won't be finishing in a hurry. Around the mid-80s, there was a short-lived craze for motorbike racers 
sequel, mainly by the Sega arcade game Hang On and its Super Sequel. Unfortunately, when it came to home ports of those coin-ops, the BBC missed out. But we don't have to be too sad because thanks to Kevin Galaforce Edwards, we got the brilliant Crazy Rider instead. You take control of one of 60 riders in a series of races held on real-life race circuits including Le Mans, Anderstor, Paul Ricard, Brands Hatch, Misano, Silverstone and the legendary Nürburgring. In order to qualify for the next race, you must finish in the top six, giving you a bit more leeway than similar games. All sounds pretty standard, right? Well, once the first race starts, you'll realise that it isn't, because your bike won't get into gear, and you watch helplessly as all the other races zoom past. Now your skills will be really put to the test, as you have to catch them all up before the chequered flag is flung down. And then we have the more crazy aspect of the game, as you're also able to gain bonus points by knocking the other racers off their bikes. You do this by sideswiping them when your bike is slightly in front of theirs. If it's the other way around, then you'll lose speed dramatically. Crazy Rider is a fast and furious racer with great graphics, smooth gameplay and awesome title music from the legendary Martin Galway. You are Commander John Stryker of the Allied Nations, and you've just obtained some top secret plans detailing an attack by your sworn enemy the Volgons. Your mission is to escape the Volgon stronghold with the plans and reach the Allied headquarters. Stryker is armed with both a laser pistol and grenades, but this is not all though, as you can also commandeer aircraft and fly them over the landscape until you run out of fuel. However, the Volgons also possess a wide range of pretty lethal weaponry too, including machine guns, mortars, mines, rocket launchers and SAM missiles, and even helicopter gunships. It has to be said that there aren't many run and gun games on the Beeb. In fact, aside from this and Xenon, the only others I can think of are RK ports in Commando and Green Beret, but neither of those are particularly good. So Striker's run is a welcome addition to the BBC library, especially as it's an Acorn exclusive. In fact, there are actually three versions aimed at different machines. The original, an enhanced BBC Master iteration with improved graphics and music by Martin Galway, and also a heavily cut down Acorn Electron port that swaps out the scrolling for flick screens. They're all fantastic in their own right, but obviously the Master version is the one to play. It's also worth noting that an equally excellent sequel, Codename Droid, followed a year later. The average school child hasn't really changed much over the years. But school has. The computer has arrived. Under a government scheme, schools all over Britain are introducing microcomputers, and they're choosing one in particular, made by Acorn. As a result, the language it uses, called BBC Basic, has become the acknowledged computer language for schools. And now parents can catch up. For Acorn have produced a micro for the home that also uses BBC Basic. It's called the Electron. It's powerful, it's versatile, and it's only £199. So now your children can teach you all they know. The Acorn Electron can be found at larger WH Smiths or your local Acorn dealer. Just call 200 0200 for your nearest stockist.
And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing exclusives for the BBC Micro. Can you think of any other exclusives for the highly influential 8-bit home computer range that should have made the list? Or do you think some of these games were unworthy of inclusion? We always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons who continue to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Sethe Robinson, Carl Olsen, Ozzy B, D Vaughan, Dos Gaming Man, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host rich content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.